We had a terrific roundtable on how to reinvent digital education with a focus on K through 12 education. This is a hugely important area that needs to get transformed for the good of the country going forward. On the first hand, we basically looked at how learning has to change, how teaching has to change. And that was a big category. We have to get to much more individualized learning, which is one of the meta shifts. And because of that, we also have to think about very fundamentally different ways that teachers have to teach. In most schools, what we teach and how we teach it and the infrastructures you, that we use for teaching is incredibly similar to how things have been for 200 years. The courses we teach haven't changed very much. Uh, the infrastructure has changed slightly. There's more smart boards around than there are uh, blackboards. It's not easy to change at an institution as large as the public education system, but we see all around us everything in the world is changing because of technology. And this is also a field that is going to need to adapt in many ways. The difference between how we taught 200 years ago and how we're going to teach in the future is that teaching will be much less like a factory and much more like an individualized, personalized experience for each child. Um, you know, students are loving um, having the access and the ability to learn on their own. I mean, lots of students are using um, Khan Academy example. We're using it in our uh, school as well. We're trying to get kids to learn how to learn themselves. 30% of U.S. high school students had smartphones at the end of 2011. At the end of 2013, that number is in the high 80%. The vast majority of high school kids do have access with devices that are actually incredibly powerful, more powerful than most computers that people had not too long ago. And so what we have the opportunity to do is not about push learning, which is what we've done since the beginning of time, but what does pull learning look like? How do we put some of the responsibility and opportunity directly into the hands of students to drive that learning themselves? That opportunity just started now. You do need a mentor. You do need a teacher. The job of the teacher probably is going to change and the way they're going to be delivering the education is going to change as we have more and more devices and connectivity. There are plenty of examples of amazing schools like Sherry's where the industrialized model of education has basically been thrown out the door where teachers are having to reinvent themselves instead of a uniform lecture kids kids learn at home or in various other contexts and then what takes place in school is is you know more inquiry based learning where kids and teachers work together in groups to dig more deeply into subjects that they wouldn't have been able to do if they were merely focused on on rote memorization what technology will do at its best is to actually allow teachers to focus on what's really important, not spend hours and hours doing lesson planning or even grading. I was actually just speaking with an educator right before this conversation. You know, many have maybe one or two very frustrating experiences with technology in the classroom, um, typically related to bandwidth, and um, therefore, and not surprisingly, feeling very hesitant to try that again. But to allow them to focus on how each child is doing and how each child is learning and how they can play a role in optimizing that for each child. And it seems to me that in the end, a teacher's job gets much better. I don't think anybody thinks, thank God we have grading being done by humans. If every teacher could just have an automated tool that says, here's what each student is having trouble with and what they've succeeded at, and the grading has been done for you, uh, I'm sure we'd have just more teaching capacity spent on what's important. But all of that is really um, at stake if you have teachers that don't know how to teach in that way. So our teaching um, schools, um, schools of education are still, as you said, teaching teachers to teach like we were all taught 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. Another major area for reinvention is what students learn. What are they, what's the curriculum? What do we, these kids have to know going forward? My view isn't that every student must learn to code as in some particular arcane language because you know computer languages come and go. And there's two things that are actually, I think, really fundamental and foundational. One is learning how technology works, just like we learn how do plants work. The other type of thing is learning how algorithms work and how to sort of break down problems into their subparts and solve them in small pieces. It's also, frankly, the reason we teach math. Learning math helps you learn how to think and solving computer programming problems by devising interesting algorithms teaches the same thing, but in a way that is actually much more linked to a potential career. Well, the average child is likely to change jobs five to seven times in their lifetime and have to relearn things, where 
the ability to think critically, to think scientifically, to think skeptically, to be able to absorb information and knowledge are the key skills going forward. And our schools have to be focused on getting our children prepared with those skills when they go into the world, whatever world they go into, which by the way is going to be very different than the world today. I think there's a whole category around collaboration. Um, so one of the things that we find in our workers that's an incredibly important thing is that those who are the most collaborative accelerate learning among the teams in the most effective way. Um, our schools are set up as kind of winner-takes-all systems where we focus on grading and competition between children as opposed to collaboration. There's almost nothing you can accomplish anymore in the world uh, without collaboration. Now, there's some great examples that you know could, you can um, hold up one of these phones and say like no one person knows how to make this. Nobody really knows how to make it. it have to, you have to build things in teams. You know, liberal arts education has traditionally meant learning a little bit about everything. And I personally believe in the 21st century, the most core part of a liberal arts education is to learn how to access the information you need and collaborate with others to get the job done. The third major area we looked at was looking at infrastructure. What is the bandwidth we need really at all these schools, how much wireless access, uh, access to tablets and devices that connect to that wireless, that's a huge thing. And one of the major discussions in there came around uh, access um, and the digital divide and how certain schools, particularly public schools in low-income areas, are, are far from uh, the norm and far from the, the levels we need to get to. Today, 63% of schools don't have the internet access they need um, today to take advantage of digital learning, and that's 100 kilobits per student. And then if you fast forward just a few years to 2018 or you know later this decade, only 1% of schools and students have what they need. So that's 40 million students um, today that don't have the internet access they need um, in their schools to take advantage of all of the great things that we've been talking about today. Um, I can tell you that in most public schools in the United States, none of this is going on in any real fashion, um, and kids certainly don't have access to it on an ongoing basis, certainly not 24-7, usually not in their homes, their homes don't have the bandwidth, um, their libraries are closed. The FCC, Federal Communications Commission, actually in July just passed um, an order and one of the things that they did in that order was to lay out clear targets and standards for what um, schools need. That's one megabit per student by 2018. We know that school districts are upgrading, uh, but they're not upgrading at the pace that um, would get them there by 2018. We believe what needs to happen essentially is that every school needs access to fiber. There's also a huge affordability issue. A big part of the reason that, that school districts don't have the um, access they need is they it's too expensive and they can't afford it. And then also the focus on Wi-Fi. A lot of districts um, trying to move towards one-to-one -one or have a goal in the near future to move closer to one-to-one -to -one or one device per student, but that requires really robust um, and ubiquitous Wi-Fi throughout the building. Now the digital divide itself clearly not only is there within the U.S., but it's even more significant globally. You know, there are certainly just vast swaths of the world where they simply do not have connectivity or devices. Your child may go to a school where the teacher has adopted some new technology that helps that kid and in a different school they don't have that. Uh, you know, it's going to take some time before this stuff evens out in terms of how we use it. Admittedly, there are there's inertia and some things are hard to change and hard to move. But I think about it a little differently, which is that this change is inevitable. And what we ought to be thinking about doing is making it happen as fast as possible. What was really clear by the end of this roundtable, whether it's coming from the technologies and entrepreneurs are bringing these technologies to the classroom or the people on the ground watching the changes from the bottom up. Despite all the challenges and all the obstacles ahead of us, uh, there's great hope that these changes are breaking out, the change is coming, and that within the next decade here, we're going to see a very different educational system. Thank you.